Floyd, you and I have had some wonderful conversations in the past, and I would like to build on that experience a bit and talk with you about problems of racism, especially in terms of economic development. Um, I know that uh, you have had uh, what I call sort of a religious conversion experience <laughs> in the past. Uh, it has the classic form to it. That is, we always say in the spiritual tradition that we need to prepare for hearing the Word of God. We prepare through disciplines, through fasting, through uh, reading the Scriptures and so on, and at least keep ourselves open to the possibility that the Lord will speak to us. So I, th I see that as sort of a classic a paradigm within the, our spiritual, common spiritual tradition, and you've gone through that and and had what, uh, maybe that isn't the right word from your perspective, but sort of a conversion experience that allows you to, I, I think, be very open to the white community. I can't help thinking of the of the experience of Malcolm X, uh, very much in the news in, uh, these days, and a very popular figure, when he went to Mecca and uh, had a conversion experience. Before that, he was always talking, not always, but often talking about the uh, blue-eyed white devil, saw the, the white community as the enemy. And then after this experience at Mecca, this tremendous conversion experience was extremely open to members of the white community. So uh, anyway, I, I really appreciate the chance to talk with you about these things. Incidentally, I met Malcolm X once Did in you? front of the mosque in... Um, Washington, D.C., along with Billy Saul Estes, who financed my education um, uh, from the time I was 11 years old through a junior college. And in fact, um, I was getting ready to um, take a trip around the world at his expense when trouble came. But uh, interesting enough about Malcolm X, um, he reached for my hand and um, I shook it. Another friend, um, Franklin Florence, was with us and Franklin extended his hands and hand and Malcolm shook it. But when Billy Saul extended his hand, Malcolm refused to shake it. This was prior to his Mecca yes. uh, experience. Words, that, it said something about his relationship with the white community and at, at that, that time. And at that time, you know, uh, I thought I was pretty pro-black, but something just went all over me. I, I couldn't mm -hmm. understand why he refused to mm -hmm. shake his hand. And then... He talked to us about what he thought integration was, and I never shall forget. He said, to him, integration was just like coffee. Uh, once you put white cream in it, you weaken it. And he said that black people should be a separate and independent mm -hmm. race, and, and, and he went on. But when he came back from Mecca, uh, his view of the world had broadened, just as mine did. Uh, I spent 18 days in my home uh, and God shut me up and shut me in. And when I came out, I came out literally a new person. I wrote my, my daddy and said to him, uh, you've got a new son. He's 54 years old, but uh, nonetheless a new son. What God did for me was he not only cleansed my body and freed my spirit but he broadened my vision and he helped me to appreciate people who were not only different, but who had different views on the same subject. And most people in Toledo have viewed me as um, anything from a rabble rouser to a radical to a racist and, and the list goes on. Although I was sincere, it's just like I knew the word, but didn't really know the word that the word revealed. I knew the book but I didn't know the man that the book revealed. Once I came to really understand and appreciate who Jesus was, I could then really appreciate people who were different, who looked differently, who act differently, and who had a different view of the same subject. Having said that, let me explain, uh, since this is racism and economic empowerment, what I understand racism to be. I don't understand it as racial prejudice. I don't understand it as job discrimination or discrimination in, in education. Those are symptoms of racism. Racism to me simply is that those people who racially define themselves as white claim for themselves the right to dominate and control those people whom they racially define as colored, black, brown, red, and yellow and thereby control the world's resources by any means necessary. Now, one of the 
things that I discovered uh, was that during uh, or following uh, slavery, 1910, 45 uh, years out of slavery, blacks in this country, however low the literacy rate among them was, owned 20 million acres of land, 65 insurance and barrel insurance companies and barrel associations. They own mom and pop stores all over the place. By 1990, they own less than 4 million acres of land and we're losing 500,000 acres a year. We only have three major insurance companies left. Something's happened. Yeah. And this is the figures you're using are from 1910. From 1910. In other words, there was some progress made up until 1910, and then when we begin to compare with 1990, the black community is worse off economically than it was before. And we have uh, sort of a growing underclass, don't we? I mean, in other words, we have a growing number of people who, by government figures, live below the poverty line, some of them sort of stuck in that condition. and. Uh, generation after generation finding themselves imprisoned in what we often call ghettos, economic ghettos at least. So that uh, the, the profile of poverty in, our, in the United States is, is important to keep in mind, isn't it? That um, of what um, it looks like in terms of the black community, which right. is not a good picture at all. That's right. Let me try to explain why I think we lost so much okay. land and lost so much economically. During the days of segregation, we were locked out of yours. We couldn't go to your school, so we took pride in our own, and we had good schools, um, those that we really and truly controlled. Um, we owned our own businesses, and we were proud of them and did not burn them down. Um, we owned um, land, lots of land, farming land. It was not unusual to, to go back home and and see thousands and thousands of acres of land that black folk own and black folk worked. Integration came. And once we were free to go to yours, because the education that we received gave us a white mind and made us respect and appreciate white values, we lost respect for our own. And so we no longer supported our own, protected our own, respected our own, because after all, we didn't really need our own as long as we could go to yours. Right here in Toledo, when I moved here, Door Street was a black mecca of businesses. Theater, uh, uh, black giant uh, appliance store, our barber shops, our beauty shops, uh, and all sprinkled throughout the black community were mom and pop stores that we owned and we operated. Uh, there were 20 service stations that we owned and or operated. There were three drug stores. Today we've got two service stations. Today we have one drug store that, that's just barely making it. And all the mom and pop stores have been taken over by others. Well, when you own the land, you own the job. When you don't own the land, you have to apply for a job. There is no way that our community can be strong unless it has a strong economic base. As long as you're depending on somebody else for the food that you eat, the clothes that you wear, um, and for the house that you live in, you will owe your soul as it goes to the company store. You've got to own your own. That is why I continually fight for blacks owning businesses um, and making sure that they get their uh, fair share of the jobs that are owned by others, especially when those jobs operate within our community. Floyd, uh, what, what seems to go wrong along this line? I mean, uh, why were these small stores lost? I mean, it, when you look at the big picture, you look like at Los Angeles and so on, and, and what went wrong there, and a lot of things that got burned down. Some of them were owned by black people, but a lot of them were owned by Asiatics, by Koreans. In fact, that's what, one of the things that seemed to cause the problems. And I mean, as an outsider looking at that, one wonders, why don't the black people own those stores anymore? Why don't they run them? Why did that happen to Door Street? 
And, and I suppose more importantly then, I mean, how are you going to get back to a situation where there is economic empowerment? But that, that seems to be sort of a strange twist, and, and one wonders why it has occurred. Well, well, Asian youngsters are trained to own their businesses. Uh, if a Jewish person, and this was explained to me um, recently, and it made so much sense, if a Jewish person um, stays on a job for a long time and uh, leaves, nobody says, why did you leave that job? They say, why did you stay that long? That long? Why, don't you have, why didn't you get your own business earlier? When black folk leave a job that they've been at a long time, the question is, why would you leave your job? You've been there so long. We do not have, unfortunately, the business mindset that most other others have. It doesn't make sense, Jim, where someone can come off the boat tomorrow, walk into the black community and open a store while we stand on the other side right. and look. Right. It, it really is, is a self-destructive thing within the black community. I mean, it, it really it has to be turned around. I've often heard that it, it is a problem often with getting loans, that uh, oftentimes black people cannot get loans uh, in order to uh, establish these kind of businesses. Well, and that that's a part of it. I can give you, uh, you know, I own a, a business. Uh, mm -hmm. I have um, a license agency here, uh, the Monroe Street License Agency. And um, uh, it's interesting um, when people think you're a preacher, you're not supposed to know anything else about anything else. You're a preacher, so you just know preaching. <laughs> 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 and so when I went to talk about getting money for this, I had a problem. Of course, it was quickly overcome, but if it hadn't been Floyd Rose, just the average person, it, they may not have been able to pull it mm -hmm. off. Yeah, a lot of it depends on, on that kind of status and, uh, yeah. and reputation that one might have. I think it's important for white people listening to this to get some sort of sense of how prevalent this racism that you were talking about is. I mean, I, there's been pro uh, reports on uh, television recently that about showing how black young men driving cars get pulled over and at a much higher rate than other people. There, it's sort of an expose that, that I saw. I don't even remember what it was on. Let me give you the stats on that. Yeah, it's please sad. do. And I, I, But I mean, it, it had such a graphic quality to me. I mean, they had white people driving the same kind of car, go do the very same things. They were not stopped. Black people were. And then they had on there, I think it was an Olympic athlete who, who himself had a big reputation and everything. He's driving around in a nice car. Um, he stopped him too. Yeah, and, yeah, and he got stopped a number of times. And then, was it the police chief? Yes, the police chief in Los Angeles told about one day his son took his car to go out and do something. And uh, if I'm remembering correctly, he said he was stopped seven times in an afternoon driving his father's Lincoln Continental uh, and, and checked out. I mean, this is. I mean, something that if whites want to try to get some feel for what it must be like to have this pervasive racism, that might be a good touchstone for let us. Me, let me give you the stats, and it's, it's difficult sometimes for me to get through this because it's so frightening. Right now, on any given day in Washington, D.C., 43% of all of the young black men between the ages of 18 and 35 will either be in jail, out on bond, on parole, uh, on probation, the subject of arrest warrants are dead. 43%. 43%. In Baltimore, Maryland, is 56%. Last year in New York, 90, 93% of everybody that was arrested, period, was black and Hispanic. In Columbus, Ohio, 90% <coughs> of all of the arrests were black. 90%. According to a recent study released by the National Center for Alternatives and, and Institutions, by the year 2000, 75% of all of the young men, black men, mm -hmm. in that age group will either be in jail, out on bond, <coughs> on parole, on probation, the subject of arrest warrants, or dead, 75%. Floyd, I think also that uh, the 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 thing with the uh, with the drugs is very revealing. While white people take drugs at a higher rate than black people, the arrest for drugs is just so much more. Uh, with the, you probably know the precise statistics. Seventy. But 
77 percent or something like that. That's correct. 77 percent of all the drug users are white. 75 percent of all of those who are arrested for drug trafficking are black. Yes, your voice is giving you trouble. (laughs) You're going to have trouble. You've got to do a lot of preaching yet today, too, I know. (laughs) So you have to keep your voice uh, somehow here. Uh, But um, I think what we're dealing with is this this question of how the economic... uh, element factors into all of this. In other words, we've got this pervasive sort of racism that we in the white community can only look at as outsiders, but the kind of statistics you're citing help to bring it home, and I think that that expose I saw just really uh, hit me in, in, a, in a different kind of way, I think, uh, what it must be like to be black. But I think if I, when I stop and ask myself, how would you get out of this? How are you going to make progress? Jobs seems to be crucial to me. Our American bishops wrote a pastoral letter <coughs> on the economy, and the whole thing was that the key is employment, that people have to get uh, jobs for uh, people like that, that people, uh, that uh, if they don't have uh, some sort of economic opportunity, they're really not going to, uh, to make it in our culture. And, and so that the, the whole key is not, you know, first of all, reform of, of the welfare system, you know, or, or it's not anything like that. Um, it, I think it's a, it's a question, really, of how you can get people to take hold themselves. We have, again, in the, in the Catholic Church what we call the Campaign for Human Development. It's an attempt to collect money to get self-help programs going for the poor. Our tagline with it is not a handout, but a way out. And the idea is that the way out is... Uh, to help people to get productive jobs. I think it's, one again, one of the good things we do in the Catholic community, at least to model what one might do. The whole idea is you find groups that are willing to uh, try to work hard, to empower themselves, maybe help them to buy a small business or, or take over their apartment complex or something so that they can feel this sort of empowerment. And I think your word is really good. You're talking economic development, and in a way uh, it is uh, sort of an economic empowerment that, that I think is really important along this line. Not a handout, but a way out is, is the key. Let me just um, speak to that for just a moment. Um, one of the reasons that uh, we're in trouble now is that the whole um, backlash or negative response to our push for, for, for jobs uh, the whole question of quotas. And what I've been doing lately is negotiating with um, big corporations here in Toledo, and they've responded well. And I've said to them, in effect, uh, let's don't talk about numbers. Let's just talk about what is right, what is fair. Uh, a construction company that builds a building in the midst of the black community and you only find black bricklayers, or white bricklayers, laying bricks on that site. There's just something not right about that. So let's not talk about um, whether or not we're going to have quotas or affirmative action. It's just wrong. It's, it's, it's wrong because what you're doing is coming into a community, getting money, and taking it out to the detriment of that community. Do you get a hearing from a uh, white uh, corporate world oh, yeah. uh, along that line? I mean, do they, when you talk fairness, does that make sense to them? Oh, that? yes. Um, uh, I don't want to get into names, yeah, of course, yeah, well, but, of, yeah. but uh, I don't mind. But in yeah. fairness to them, yeah. I would not do it because they've really worked over the last few months, especially have they worked well with us, and uh, they've responded positively. Not only have they agreed to hire more blacks, and especially uh, on sites that are in our community, but they've also offered training. So we're looking beyond just uh, owning a job, but owning a business for other people to work. Um, I have a business, and I employ five people, and incidentally, two of them are white. Um, I make it my business to employ uh, whites as well as blacks. And I will always do that uh, for several reasons. I think, number one, that job sites that, that provide service to all of us should reflect all of us. And so that's one reason I applaud uh, recent comments made by um, Mr. Clinton. Uh, he said that his administration will reflect the complexion of the nation. And I think that's the right thing to do. It's the fair thing to mm-hmm. do. 
And so what we're seeing here is this uh, economic development is absolutely crucial. Floyd, I was um, reading about a group or heard about it. It's called STRIVE. I don't know what it really stands for, if it is an acronym or not. But it is a privately funded um, group run by people who have broken out of the cycle of poverty. There's several sites around the country. I think there's one in Harlem. And their whole thing is to train other people to get jobs. But the trainers themselves are people who were uh, living below the poverty line, who did not have jobs, and who found a way to get employed and who have sort of made it. And um, I heard the interview uh, where they were talking to the, to the people. There were women present, and they were saying that they had to dress in a certain way in order to, when they applied for their jobs, and they take the jewelry off was one That's of right. their things. And then they were telling them how to conduct themselves. They were insisting in these training sessions that they had that, that people not be late, that if they were late the third time, they're out of the whole training program. In other words, uh, these people had sort of a harsh approach but they, it, I guess it's palatable. I mean, if somebody, if some white person was in there telling them that, they probably wouldn't be too happy about it. But these were minorities who had made it, and I think they had earned the right maybe to speak harshly. But it was really good because it was not only helping people get jobs, but then they helped them find daycare support. If they had children, they tried to, to give them tips after they had the job. They... Um, tried to make the people, and I, I thought this was especially crucial, to feel worthwhile about themselves, that they had something to offer and contribute. That gave them the psychological side, and they found that a high percentage of these people were able to keep their jobs. It's one of those, as I like to call them, signals of hope, uh, a program that seems to actually be working, and it is very much this empowering of self. And I think some churches, in, incidentally, helped to fund this uh, and make this STRIVE program possible. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, there are certain things that successful people have in common, and I share them everywhere I go. Uh, one is they all get up early. And I tell anybody, I, I get up at 5 o'clock every morning. I get up at 5. Somebody said, why do you do that? Is it because you just want to get up at 5? No, I don't want to get up at 5. But I want to accomplish something more than I want to stay in the bed later than 5. So I get up at 5, I have my quiet time, my prayer time, my meditation time, then I study. Um, I have, um, I'm an ombudsman's man from the Board of Education. I have a church. I have two radio programs. I make speeches all during the week. Um, then I have uh, my community in involvement. Uh, to, to do all of that, you have to have quiet time and you have to get up early. And the truth of the matter is, the early bird still gets the worm. People who know the most, do the most. People who do the most, have the most. Uh, people who are successful always set goals. These are things that we have to instill in young black, uh, black youngsters now. Uh, and, and if it becomes a part of their lifestyle, you don't have to worry about them making it later. That's a well, point well taken. I'm thinking of, you know, what has helped within the white community in the United States, especially in the Protestant world, is what we often call the Protestant ethic, the teaching of John Calvin that uh, the way we conduct ourselves on this earth indicates whether we're going to be <laughs> saved in the next. And it, it had a strong sense of keep your nose to the grindstone. Uh, if your place was clean, that was a good example that you were going to be saved. Um, I must say that in times past, the, the Calvinistic uh, world often used that against the Catholics. The Catholic immigrants here were looked down upon because they were lazy. They didn't work hard. They didn't have the same work ethic. They uh, often had too many children. They drank too much. They were dirty and so on. All stuff that went on in the 19th century and into the 20th in relationship to the Catholic community. So you, as a member of the black community, me as a member of the Catholic community, have had to learn how to deal with that Protestant ethic in one way or another. What many Catholics have done, frankly, who have made it, is buy into it. And that's a mixed bag. I mean, that's not <laughs> always a totally good thing. But we, we, a lot of Catholics have bought into it so that we are hardworking and uh, have uh, disciplined ourselves and have moved up the socioeconomic ladder. So we're now the most affluent Gentile groups around, Catholic, Irish Catholic, German Catholic, Polish Catholic. Now, that ethos has to be factored in here somehow. In other words, uh, what would be the comparable touchstone for the black world to say, you know, that there is an ethic that's involved here of responsibility, hard work that would help us make it economic? Well, I can tell you now, anybody who comes to the church where I preach on any Sunday that you come, 
there, are, there is one message that you're going to always get Sunday after Sunday, and that is spiritual renewal, educational excellence, and economic empowerment. I am convinced, Jim, that without these three in concert and in combination with each other, nobody's going to be successful. You can't separate the soul from the body. You can't have a full stomach and a starved soul and a star stuffed stomach uh, or a, a stuffed soul and a starved stomach. And pe young people who have some sense of God, by whatever name they call him, but sense, some sense of their relationship to their creator and who strive for educational excellence and have some sense of economic empowerment, those young people don't pick up guns and sniff out the lives of others. They accomplish things in life. Floyd, I think you've really summarized well what your message is, and the three points are worth uh, remembering. This spiritual renewal, which is rooted in faith in God, which gives us hope that we can accomplish and do things. Educational excellence, which says we have to uh, try to improve our schools from top to bottom, from yes. the young through the old, that that is part of the way. And then, this, as you've described it, this economic empowerment, economic development, which uh, insists that uh, jobs are absolutely crucial. Jobs are crucial to self-worth, to feeling better about oneself, and therefore being able to make a contribution. Floyd, I want to thank you for being on the program with me, and I, I really appreciate your current efforts to reach out to the white community. I hope that all of us find our way now to collaborate, because uh, really we are together. We live in a global village. It's one world. It's one human family, and we're going to survive together.